On 18th of February, 1943, the building of Munich's Ludwig Maximilian University was densely surrounded by soldiers. Jakob Schmidt, the janitor of the university, had called the local Gestapo half an hour earlier and reported that he had just seen a girl throwing leaflets down the main staircase of the university. The Gestapo men reacted in an instant. They had been on the hunt for six months for an unknown organization that had been distributing anti-Nazi leaflets all over Germany. All entrances were blocked and everyone inside the building was subjected to a thorough search. The Gestapo found what they needed in the bag of one of the students, a sketch of one of the leaflets. The student and his companion were arrested. Now, this is how the White Rose Student Anti-Fascist Organization ceased to exist. This is X War History and today's topic will be about the White Rose Organization. The detained student's name was Hans Scholl. He was a medical student and the organizer of the White Rose. The girl was a philosophy student and Hans' sister, Sophie Scholl. She was also an active member of the White Rose and was seen by the janitor when she threw the rest of the leaflets down the stairs. In contrast to the many resistance movements against forms of fascism in other countries, in Germany itself the underground was rarely communist or in any way associated with Soviet ideology. The thing is that all the seeds of such ideology were suppressed in the 30s with Hitler's rise to power. Therefore, the protest within Germany was based on the principles of German culture and universal human values, but above all, the values of the Christian values of morality. And this was also the case with the White Rose. Hans and Sophie's parents were deeply religious evangelical Lutherans and raised their five children in an appropriate atmosphere of faith and devotion to biblical commandments. Their father was not afraid to speak directly to their children about the destructive policies of the ruling powers, and in 1942 he even served some time in prison for speaking negatively about Hitler in a conversation with a fellow soldier. Yet, Hans himself was influenced by National Socialist propaganda in his youth, and at one time was even a squad leader in the Hitler Youth. His older sister Inga later recalled this period as follows. At that time there was a lot of talks about homeland, fellowship, the united German people and love for the motherland. We liked that. We listened with admiration to such speeches at school and on the street. Hitler said he wanted to serve the glory and well-being of the native country. Who wouldn't like that? But things soon fell into their proper place. Young Hans soon realized that behind the beautiful Nazi slogans lay a grim essence. His disagreement resulted into his trial and exile from the Hitler Youth, and from that point on, Hans became an undaunted opponent of the Nazi regime. This is from his letter to his father. Tell me, Dad, does the Führer know about the existence of concentration camps? Does he know how party discipline is enforced in the youth detachments? Does he know that mentally ill children are taken away from clinics to some unknown locations? Why are those who are released from the camps forbidden, under penalty of death, to tell what they have experienced just why and how was such a government and such a leader able to gain a foothold in our own country? His sister Sophie went through a similar period of formation, only later, since she was three years younger than Hans. She was also an activist in the girls' division of the Hitler Youth, but very quickly became disillusioned with Nazi core values. And this was no blind imitation of her brother. Unlike Hans, who had chosen medicine as his future, Sophie had gravitated towards creativity since childhood, was artistically gifted and quite good at drawing, and eventually chose to study at the philosophy department of the university. Before the beginning of the war with the Soviet Union, Hans had been drafted to the Western Front, and in 1942, being already a medical student, together with his friend Alexander Schmorl, also a medical student and future organizer of the White Rose, was drafted to the Eastern Front, near the city of Smolensk. It was there, near Gzhatsk, that, having seen with his own eyes the horrors of not only the SS, but also the Wehrmacht in general in this awful war, Hans was finally convinced that he had to oppose the brutal regime. Returning to Munich in the summer of 1942, Hans Scholl and Alexander Schmorl compile and handprint the first leaflet, numbering 100 copies. Well, as we explained to you earlier about the general basis of German anti-fascist main ideas, the content of the proclamation is of a general culturally appropriate nature and includes a paragraph from a 19th century poem by the poet Gottfried Keller and invokes the conscience of the whole nation. Ironically, the text is printed on a Remington borrowed from Alexander's mate, who was a hardened Hitlerite. The first individuals to receive the leaflets are chosen at random from the regular phone book, simply by writing the address on an envelope and mailing it in. 
As naive as the idea and organization of this action was, it was in fact successful, and so the White Rose was born. The name White Rose is interpreted by researchers in many different ways. The name's motive is found in a fragment of the brothers Karamazov, in Goethe, and even in Dante. But the main version of the origin of this name goes back to the title of the novel written by Bruno Traven. In addition to Hans, Sophie, and Alexander, the organization includes also other students from their university and one of their professors, philosophy professor Kurt Huba. The organization prints the following pamphlets with the help of photocopiers, and in just six months they printed six texts of proclamations and distributed them throughout Germany as well as in Austria. It can be argued that under their influence, the Saarbrücken Group, Ankle Mill in Berlin, and the Ulm Group later emerged. At the beginning of February of 1943, White Rose activists painted many anti-fascist graffiti on city buildings and the Munich University building with black paint. The graffiti read a very precise and open messages, down to Hitler and freedom. And on February 18th came the unleashing with which we began this whole story at the beginning of the video. So Hans and Sophie were captured by the Gestapo. Subsequent events unfolded rapidly. Three days after their detention, a trial took place, which could hardly be called a real trial. It was the so-called People's Tribunal, a separate emergency body that dealt with cases of state treason, espionage and other purely political crimes. Roland Freisler, the chairman of the tribunal, arrived from Berlin and already had hundreds of innocently convicted people under him. On February 22nd of 1943, Hans and Sophie Scholl were sentenced to death, along with Christoph Probst. And that same evening, on February 22nd of 1943, they were executed. In completely medieval spirit, they were beheaded with the help of the guillotine. It is worth noting that Hitler, as early as in 1933, upon coming to power, ordered the purchase of 20 guillotines made of high-strength steel. And during the 12 years of the regime, about 40,000 people were executed by means of this mechanism. This particular guillotine, on which the Nazis executed Hans and Sophie Scholl, is still on display today in the Bavarian National Museum. When Hans Scholl was executed, he was 23 years old and Sophie was 21. The square in front of the University of Munich is named after them. There is also a monument in the form of scattered leaflets commemorating the activities of the student anti-fascist movement, White Rose. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe for more videos from X War History and leave a like.